Oh yeah, I heard people talk about the Pony Express one. Yeah, that was the most about that. <laughs> <laughs> what? I haven't heard that about it. Hmm? Oh, not not today. Next week, though. So I have your exams. I'll probably give them back to you during lab and while you were looking at all the fun things. Oh, good thing about lab. So we got Plankton in, and then uh, Nicole was really awesome in the stock room. So if you see her, like, give her a big thank you because she pulled out a bunch of specimens, too, for you guys to look at. So hopefully you'll have lots of fun. So it'll be, like, extra stuff than what the lab has so you can look at some of the at least specimens of critters you would have seen had we been able to go to the coast. And I'm glad to hear that at least some people have made their own trips and, you know, are seeing fisheries, so that's awesome. I love the pictures. I haven't put in extra credit points yet, so hopefully today that's my goal. Yeah. Yeah, but the, it's just if you go, but there's nothing to fill out. So, like, on the coast field trip with all the charts, I said, like, X, all that. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about oh, exactly. Oh, that. Because I've been working uh, on this. I can't remember what the pictures you sent. What are we supposed to do for that then? So, I've posted a Blackboard announcement of just kind of suggestions and how to fill it out as best you can. And you can, like, X out. Uh, I, I've posted, like, the sea lion, so that should help you with, like, the pinnipod. But there's like some stuff with the touch tank, so like that's fine if you just skip that portion. But yeah, I posted it on Blackboard with just everything with the Monterey videos and then like some tide pool stuff. I haven't seen a whole lot of Blackboard posting. Did you check too? Um, I did uh, just the Ocean World, whatever, Crescent City. Um, and they came up, uh, there were two videos that were pretty good, which one basically like takes things to the shore. So um, then it was kind of fun. It was kind of like cheap cheating, but like I really. <laughs> um, and uh, it was pretty fun because two of them, one of them is like six minutes and one is going to take 14 minutes. Yeah. So one minute has most of the uh, sea lion shell and it's like the longer one. And the six minute has more touch tank, but we can talk about it. Is that different from Monterey? Slide cam? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's why I posted. Like tuna hammerhead and that was it the entire time. Yeah, because I had posted, like, other videos for the tide pool, but we can talk about that today uh, as we look at the plankton lab so you, I can help you finish up the other lab and what we need to write or not write. All right, so today we're going to try to get through two chapters. At least that's what's on the goal. Oh, and like I posted, so exam, 
For all the moaning and groaning, the average was still a 74, which was the same average of the first exam, so I'm not too concerned. Um, and like I've mentioned, the, your final grades, I'm planning to give it on a range from A to Cs, right? I'm not looking to fail anybody, so just turn in all your work, so that would be the only grounds for failure. But I don't think anybody's in that position. There are a few people that just need to give me their organism journals, but that's not a big deal. But I think everybody's been keeping up with the lab, so that's really good. And again, just pester me. Uh, I haven't, again, fixed grades. I, I know there's been emails of like missing grades, but I'll try to fix that today. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what it's about. Like, just turning in the work, getting it done, that's what we care about. So, you, you know, hopefully learn something. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard. I mean, we crammed a lot in eight weeks. It was a fast pace. So, yeah, I, like, all I ask is y'all try, and we'll get through it. And, you know, and we'll see how the grades shake out. I know people are concerned, but, again, I'm not looking to fail anybody or give Ds, everyone did efforts and like like I said we'll see how the grades look at the end so I can't make promises so but like the average fail was yeah which was exactly the same and but like I mentioned right I'd probably want a like a B class average so that means if this is the average right I might have to curve a little later but again I don't do curving until the very end because usually all your labs kind of buffer everything out anyways, and it's not as bad as you think. So we'll kind of see. All right. I think, oh, and then, of course, just a reminder, our final slash, it's really more like exam three. Since it's not cumulative, it will just be over chapters 11 through 15. So 11 we'll be doing on Monday, or not Monday, Tuesday. Can't remember when I have. So that's a little tight. Again, I'll try to keep it broad with the questions that I ask, but yeah, chapter 11 on Tuesday. It's like, because we have one more chapter, so chapter 11, and then that leaves Thursday. Yeah, so it's pretty tight. Again, that's the eight week summer schedule, unfortunately, but y'all have been hanging with it, so just, just keep with it, right? at the end here. All right, and I appreciate y'all. Again, thank you for being excellent students over this course. All right, let's go into chapter 14. So starting with the pelagic environment and so looking at our marine animals. And so these are kind of more animals that swim around in the ocean. And so of course we'll be looking at their adaptations and so the first thing that obviously they need is, well, how do they swim around in the ocean all day? And so many of them have structures that help them be buoyant. So kind of mentioned that before. So swim bladders. So again, this is kind of a recurring theme that has come up in several chapters that these organisms have some sort of swim bladder and it could be filled with gas or, like we mentioned before, a fatty fluid. And they can right compress that gas, let air in and out, depending at what depth they go at. And I mentioned some of them are limited in their depth then by their bladder. So, of course, gas can only be compressed so much. And if your structure right can only withstand so much pressure, that limits your depth. So, again, just other... <coughs> swim bladders, so looking how they have that little pneumatic duct, which allows them to put in and air in and out. And so it mentions, right, two distinctions of fish here also with the swim bladders. So ones that do contain the pneumatic duct, so that allows them to more rapidly change depth. So let's add that, allows for more rapid depth change. So again, right with that tube, it can add or take out air as it swims up and down in depth. And then versus if we look at this other fish down here, so this fish does not have a pneumatic duct. So it still has a swim bladder though, 
but instead the gas has to be exchanged through the blood. And so we want to add so a big picture to that. So with no pneumatic duct, then it's much slower to change depth. Right, so then these fish, they have to wait for the gases to diffuse, so that's going to be a slower process, so they cannot just adapt to changes in depth quickly. And so we mentioned, right, other organisms have other different abilities, and so such as, right, the zooplankton. So we mentioned those were the primary consumers eating the phytoplankton. And we have mentioned this again before when we mentioned the diatoms earlier, how they have fats or oils to stay afloat. And so looking at our floating zooplankton, they also have certain shapes to help them be buoyant. And so if we look at this class, so looking at these radiolarins, so that just means they have these nice kind of poking out structures of shells. And so you can see the different types there. And so they're made of silica. And again, so if we look at their structure, so they're kind of right all holy and not very dense. And that's so they can be buoyant on the water and kind of float and not just right sink to the bottom as a heavy organisms. They want to keep their density very light. And then we have this other type of zooplankton, so form foraminifers. And so they look like this. So they're pretty small. And they're, again, uh, plankton-like. These are made of calcium carbonate. And they are single-celled protozoans. And then our next class of zooplankton are the copepods. And so these are, again, microscopic, but they're going to be like shrimp-like in their movements and have little antenna so, and segmented bodies and some joined legs. So again, just like your crab looks, just on a much smaller level. And so they also have an exoskeleton, so that's not listed there. And of course, a lot of the ocean zooplankton biomass is a lot of these copepods here. And then moving slightly up to macroscopic zooplankton. So this would be krill, so all your crustaceans, bless you. So those are like little mini shrimp. So this is a lot of what the whales eat. So we'll talk about the whales a little later. And so they're pretty small, so no longer than two inches. And so a lot of the krill is abundant near Antarctica. And so, of course, this is pretty critical for the food chains in Antarctica and also where marine animals flock to food sources. And then going into more macroscopic oops, sorry, zooplankton, is we have where our uh, cnidarians, so soft body stinging tentacles. And then we have a distinction here. So the hydrozoan, so an example of being the Portuguese man of war, is just more like a floating organism. And so, of course, right, this one still has those stinging tentacles that I think were several feet long and, of course, can be poisonous to people, but they don't have a mechanism of movement, so they just depend on the ocean to move them around. And of course, oops, they can wash up on shore if they're brought in by the waves. Is that like a jellyfish? It, it's a distinction, though, because jellyfish are different in that they have locomotion, right? So you've seen how jellyfish kind of floop around, so they take in water 
and then rush it back out. So that's the distinction. So they're both this uh, Cnidarians category, right, where they're just considered soft bodies. So again, no circulatory system, just their fluids moving around. But the difference, so the, again, the hydrozoan is just more of a float base organism. And so it mentions gas fields, so that just means it has some buoyancy. But again, it can't propel while the jellyfish can propel. So it has muscular contraction. So that's the distinction. So it kind of looks like a jellyfish, both stinging. So that's they're similar in that they sting. But again, the Portuguese man of war floats. And so they can also be small. So of course, there's different, a wide range of them. And I'm sure people have seen jellyfish before in aquariums. And I'm sure you've seen different ranges of little small ones. And then they can get all the way up to two meters or fairly large. And so more swimming organisms. And so of course, we'll look at kind of how they swim from fish to marine animals and kind of how their bodies are designed. And so squids move by taking water in and then expelling it out kind of through the jet. And then we can look at fins. And so this might be important. I I haven't decided if this is too detailed or not, and you can give me some feedback. But this is kind of important. So we have our pelvic fins and our pectoral fins are for steering and balance. And maybe this is a good, really big picture idea where the caudal fin, so right there, tail fin, that's what provides the thrust. And so a lot of the shape Right, kind of tells you how fast the fish swims or how quick it can turn. So that's pretty interesting. And so like we mentioned, they also have that lateral line, which serves as some sort of sensor, so it detects the water pressure changes. I think they also mentioned that's probably how the fish are part of how the schools of fish move. So. I still think they're not quite sure, but they somehow get some sort of signaling and can tell uh, how the whole school moves. So caudal fin, again, that's important. And so movement just is from the contraction and relaxation. So they do that kind of side to side movement. And again, that caudal fin generates the thrust. And we'll just appreciate the difference. I won't go into this much detail, but you can at least appreciate how the different shapes lead to the different characteristics. So we have our rounded caudal fins. So this is going to be flexible, and they tend to go more at low speeds, though. So kind of this blue angel, blue face angel is a example, or flounder fish. And then if we zoom in to this truncated caudal fin, so this is kind of small, but this is good for maneuvering quickly and having some quick thrust so they can kind of move away and quickly maneuver. It's uh, like, yeah, it's really small. So they called it a truncated. So kind of like it's really short. So it's more like for quick maneuvering. I think it's with how it turns. I'm not quite sure.
Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying. This body is almost like a swinging tail. <laughs> oh. and how it kind of comes down. Yeah, and oh. like when it does its tail, it also kind of stays its back with you and take off whenever you want to use the little tail swing to turn it over to the other. Yeah, because yeah, it can also help them turn. Because it mentions with like the other designs, especially with the shark, like it's are kind of it has an asymmetric design. Which we have the picture here. Yeah. So like comparing the shark design, which is this heterocaudal fin, where it has like a big one and a little one. So that means that they actually can't turn as quickly. So sharks kind of swim in a big circle since they don't. <laughs> yeah. So it's just all about. It's kind of like yeah your turning radius too with your shape of the fin. And so then the, uh, the fork caudal fins, so these are again also good uh, for propulsion and maneuvering, maneuvering, so generally on the fast fish. And so it also depends on the shape of the forking, so those are small. And then again, another really s small fins here, right? The, they call them the lunate fins. And so they're very small and rigid, and so they're good just for the forward motion, but they did, since they don't have right, a flap here, they're not as good for the turning. And then like we mentioned, that heteroceracodal fin where it's bigger on top and then smaller on the bottom, which again kind of helps them maneuver. It also mentions that their fin shape is essential for them since sharks don't have a swim bladder, so then they have to swim so they can keep buoyant. And so their asymmetric back fin helps with that. Oh, and it mentions that too. And so how do they hunt? And so it depends on their mobility, so whether they're lungers or cruisers. And so for example, right, a lunger, so it shows this grouper here, and so it would just kind of wait. And so it mentioned that these types of fish are also comprised of white tissue, which just meant Right, less hemoglobin, which leads, that's just short for hemoglobin. So that leads to uh, right, less O2, rich. And so all that means is that they're not going to be consuming a lot of energy. So again, they're just waiting there. And then they have their white tissue, which is good for the short burst that they need when their prey finally comes. But then these cruisers... So that, such as the tuna here. So now these are going to have lots of red tissue. And so that's going to, again, have more hemoglobin, which, of course, means that it's better at binding oxygen, having oxygen. And so, of course, all that oxygen-rich tissue means that it can swim those long distances of speed. So it makes them excellent cruisers and hence how they can go around and of course that also makes them better hunters if they have more of this red tissue they can swim around and hopefully catch some prey and so again just recap of that so again what we want to take away is that the cruisers have red tissue so they can get more oxygen and therefore move more. So right, more oxygen just means it's more mobile. That's the takeaway. Versus, again, the white tissue lungers. And so again, the swimming speed is important and speed is generally proportional to size. So again, as a organism, I should have just written fish. As an organism gets larger in size, then it usually also gets faster. That's why the speed increases. That's just in general. And so most fish are cold-blooded, 
And all that means is that they're the same temperature as their environment. And if they are cold-blooded, they will probably also be not a fast swimmer. And that makes sense, right? If you're cold-blooded, you're not, um, you don't have a high metabolism, right? Because you're not needing to make your own heat. But that probably means that you're not expending a lot of energy. So hence, you're not going to be a fast swimmer. And then fish that are going to be warm-blooded tend to be more mobile. And so that's going to be homeothermic. So just meaning, again, they can maintain their own temperature. So warm-blooded. And some are found in warmer environments, but they have also found uh, fish. I think they mentioned... Uh, tuna have been found in really cold waters of 7 degrees Celsius, so they are super efficient at still maintaining their body temperature of um, 30 degrees Celsius. Bless. And of course, again, if you're warm-blooded, you're probably mobile. Let's, I'll just put the tuna there as a good example, because we already mentioned, right, the tuna has all the red flesh, it can move, and then it's also warm-blooded. And so now switching over to the deep water, so of course, as we go deeper down into the water, obviously there's the lack of available sunlight. And so if that means that there's not a lot of sunlight, right, we don't have those primary producers, we don't have the, the plankton. And so that means that they consume the detritus, right, so all the dead stuff. So we kind of mentioned that before, that the ocean's pretty good at cleaning up after itself. So all, right, the poop, the dead organisms, all that can float down. And of course, right, this can also influence the environment a lot. So if you have like a dead whale, obviously that will provide a huge rich source of nutrients all of a sudden, and that could, you know, have a lot of life there living around that dead whale. And again, obviously the lack of food is kind of what drives this and also different pockets of life. And a lot of these animals are or fish, I should say, are bioluminescent. And so that's just kind of unusual, right? There's not too many bioluminescent creatures. So there's the, you know, some fireflies are famous, and then I think other little insects. But not too many uh, that we see. But in the sea, 90% are bioluminescent. So that's, I mean, that's quite a lot, again, relatively speaking. And so they have chemicals in them that make light. And with that, the fish can also take advantage of any little light that is created. And so they have adaptations of large sensitive eyes and uh, also sharp teeth, so they're ready to attack. And so we've kind of touched on this in this class as well. You guys are familiar how some of the deep sea fish, right, they stand there open with their mouth wide and might have like a light in them or what looks like a light. And so that attracts some fish over. And then, of course, right, they have those large, sharp teeth, so they're ready to eat whatever walks by because you don't want to miss out on an opportunity. And what's also interesting is it mentioned, right, those hinged jaws. And so, again, that fish that's waiting, it has an extra big jaw that it can unhook and therefore eat something larger than itself. So that's kind of scary. Then some also use, again, with the thought of bioluminescence, so these are related thoughts, that they have this counter-illumination technique. So if you can kind of create your own light and then blend in with the little bit of sunlight that's trickling through, then you can kind of blend in and camouflage there, acting like you're the, the little light. And... I think people have mentioned before in this class how scary the deep sea fish look. So you probably have seen pictures before. So kind of these big deformed bodies and large eyes. And they look pretty creepy. Yeah. And then they have this poor angler fish and the poor 
parasitic male anglerfish, poor guy. And then here's again more deep sea anglerfish. So all of these, of course, try to attract prey and look pretty scary with their large jaws. Yeah, which is also pretty freaky. Like their body can adapt and compress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'd probably look weird too. So yeah, here's this big fish. Again, notice, right, the huge teeth and its huge jaw eating that fish. And so how do other fish avoid getting eaten? And so now back to the middle of the ocean environment. And so many of the fish swim in schools. So a school you're probably familiar with is just a large group of fish and their safety and numbers. So a lot of that is right, you have everybody there. So kind of the probability of a predator finding one of your species somewhere else is lower. And then it also works to confuse them. And so it A may appear like a large species, you know, if a shark is maybe coming by and there's a huge fish, school of fish, it may think it's too big and it can't eat it. But then also moving all together helps confuse the predator. So the pre predator is trying to, you know, chomp down on one fish, but the whole school is moving as a unit, so it's hard for it to even target the individual fish. And so even if it is successful, it would I ideally and theoretically eat less fish than again if they were kind of on their own and not acting in this way or maybe again it would even get confused or only pick off a few if it can't really chomp down. And so then we have different types of symbiosis where uh, two or more organisms mutually benefit from some association. That is a good example. So then there's three different examples of symbiosis. So it breaks it down further. So this is just kind of more general. And so the first, or the first three it classifies them into are the commensalism, where the less dominant organism benefits without harming the host. And so ex an example of this is these remora fish attached to the lemon shark. And they don't really do anything so that they just get transported around and benefit from eating food while hanging off of the shark, but they don't hurt the shark. Shark doesn't really benefit though. And so these might be terms to know just as a hint of what's the difference. So again, commensalism, one benefits, the other does, doesn't, but it's not harmed, right? And then mutualism is where both organisms benefit. And so one example is the clownfish and the anemone. And so the uh, clownfish is cleaned by the anemone, and then uh, and the anemone, of course, protects the clownfish, and the anemone gets food, of course, from the clownfish, scraping it off. So that's beneficial, so that's mutualism. Again, both benefit. And then parasitism is, of course, the parasite benefits at the expense of the host. And so one example is the isopod here that's attached to the head of the soldier fish. And of course, usually the parasite is just sucking enough nutrients to of course keep itself alive, but it doesn't want to hurt the host so much that the host dies or anything, because then, right, the organism dies as well. But <laughs> yeah, so it'll just suck you for a little bit, but you know. <laughs> or ticks, although sometimes ticks get like out of control and that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> All right, so now switching. So now we're switching to mammals. 
and some mammals. Of course, many of them, uh, they of course are linked evolutionary to land animals. They're warm-blooded, of course. And we're obviously under the mammal. They have to breathe air, so we mentioned that right with dolphins that they have to come and get air. Uh, they have at least some sort of hair, fur, if even only a small amount at some point in their life. Then they bear live young and then have mammary glands for milk. And so this is the overview of everything we're going to be talking about in this marine class. So we'll start with the carnivora order. So we'll get the sea otters, and then we have our order Sirenia, which is our manatees and dugongs, so look at that distinction, and then Cetacea, which includes, right, the dolphins and the whales, so we'll look at that distinction as well. All right, so we'll start with, again, our carnivora. So they have canine teeth for eating meat. And so in this category, we have sea otters, polar bears, and our pinnipeds, which are walruses, seals, sea lions, and fur seals. And so sea otters, you might see them in the coast, so they inhabit the kelp in the coastal eastern North Pacific. And of course, they have extremely dense fur. They do not have insulating blubber, though. And then they were, I thought they did have blubber. I don't know, they were hunted for their pelt, so hunted for their fur. But then they were made a recovery. And so they also eat, of course, lots of marine animals. And people like watching them because, of course, they use tools. So sometimes they use rocks, right, to smash the. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so they're fascinating to watch them, you know, crack open all their food and float on their back. And they have, of course, a high caloric need swimming around. That's pretty cute. Now, now we just want to cuddle and see otters. <laughs> oh, and then so polar bears have big web paws, of course, and they're excellent swimmers. Of course, they're big hunters, and they have thick fur. They eat a lot of seals. And your book made some claim about the polar bear population declining. And I had to do a fact check, unfortunately. And so I pulled up, so this just tells you the state of research and the complication. Also, this is why I like teaching chemistry. We don't have all this. Uh, we're, so this is, this is just the inherent problem with the textbook that is trying to cite new information, right? New stuff is coming out all the time. And so state of the polar bear, 2021. Here's kind of the issue, though, with science, at least the current state of science, not to get too into it, but obviously this is done by the Global Warming Policy Foundation. So obviously they're looking at it through a certain lens. So just keep that in mind. But let's just skip down to the relevant information. Okay. Sorry, trying to zoom in. And so they talk about the numbers here, because your book says the population was declining. And so they only have been surveying uh, the population since like 1981 or so, but they said that they estimated it to be about 16,000 to 26,000. And then again, uh, 1993, they said it was about 21 to 28, so kind of fuzzy. And then they made some things that 
they're not even sure if these estimates were right, which is kind of interesting. And then 2005, there were 24,000. And then, let's see, latest July estimates from 2021 is 26,000. And so it actually looks like it's been increasing in population. And so it also has this little chart here. Again, estimates of the global bear population. We haven't been tracking it that long. But here's 1960 versus 2021. So again, it looks like they've actually been increasing from this data. So just putting that out there, just always got to keep up to date and fact check. And they also mentioned some other things in here. So, I mean, we'd have to read all this in more depth because it's not even like quite clear what they're saying. Uh, so predictions that the species is suffering, right, doesn't seem to be true. And so they didn't have any reports of starvation or cannibalism or drowning. So it looks like the bears are doing okay in 2021. And then they also mentioned that there are fewer reports of problems or attacks. So that's a good sign. So that means that right, they're probably getting plenty of food in their environment and they're not having to go bother humans to survive. Uh, and they even, and this was like an interesting statement to me, but I'm not about to fully try to unpack it all. Plus, again, this is where like trying to study the world and the environment and the ecosystem gets complicated. But they said that the primary ecosystem productivity in the Arctic has continued to increase because of the longer ice-free periods and thinner sea ice. And so it says that that's why polar bears are thriving. So that's what we'll say about that. All right, moving on to walruses. So walruses have really large bodies and adults of both genders have the ivory tusk. And so they're pretty large animals. I didn't say how big they got. Walruses are pretty huge. And then we have our seals. And so seals are different from sea lions. So they show the two here. So seals are called earless seals or true seals, different from the sea lions. And so the other difference between them, so we have the differences here. So again, seals have black prominent ear flaps. And then they also have these smaller front flippers with little claws. I don't know if you can kind of see that in the picture. See how they have like little nails on their claw. But then what's uh, really, at least in my mind, what kind of distinguishes the a lot is the hip structure. And so I think everyone's kind of familiar with the sea lions, right? Because they're really cute. They can waggle around and swing around and do all sorts of tricks. And that's because they have a, a hip that's more suitable for that. So they can flip their bodies around and that gives them good mobility on land. Whereas the seal does not have that. So it cannot do the cool tricks, we'll say, of the sea lion distinction there. And so then the next order is this order, Sirenia. And so this is kind of cute origins, kind of like sirens, right? Mermaids. And so these are kind of mystical floating creatures is kind of their name origin or And so all these animals are herbivores. And so they just eat shallow water coastal grasses. And so this is going to be your manatees uh, in your coastal areas of your Atlantic Ocean. So like Florida, maybe have any of y'all like seen manatees or like, yeah. so you've So if you're out fishing out, you're going to see salmon 
Yeah, I was curious because your book mentions that, like, you know, in Florida there were a bunch of accidents, and oh, I yeah. remember hearing about that, but do you know, do, do they stop allowing, like, motorboats or... Yeah. That even like if if a boat's coming along and like wake less two miles an hour, um, like they're in danger of turning into like big big stoners. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, your book mentions that they're sea cows, but when you call them lazy stoners, it's like, yeah, the sea cows is a perfect name for them. It's like. <laughs> and these are also pretty unique animals. So they're, you know, just bees are in this order of the Sirenia, so that's kind of interesting too, fairly unique evolutionarily, or however that may have arisen. And so here's the dugong, and so this is found in the coastal areas of India and the Western Pacific Ocean. And so again, kind of floater. And so now moving on to order Cetacea. So this encompasses a lot in this order. So we have small porpoises, dolphins, and of course large whales in here, and large variety in size. So here's a huge sperm whale. You can see that, another large gray whale here. And of course, compared to like a smaller dolphin, there's a person for kind of reference. And so what distinguishes them is they have this elongated skull and then a blowhole on the top, so of course they can breathe. And then they have very few hairs and they're also very streamlined in their body, so they're really sleek in the water. And so again, it mentions the adaptions to swimming, so these super streamlined bodies, so they really have a reduced drag and so they can just leak through the water. And so they also have this weird skin structure that's 80% water and that uh, allows them to again swim and withstand different pre pressures as they dive. So. And so what's also interesting is they seem to be well adjusted to deep diving even though they might experience the bends like we do. And so we kind of mentioned that in the book. And so let's first look at how it starts. So first of all, they're pretty efficient at absorbing oxygen, but then they can still are able to survive not only as their oxygen de depletes, but what's also a difficulty is that as you swim, the nitrogen uh, becomes more prevalent in your bloodstream anyways, so that's just different pressures and how the gases dissolve. And so the, it looks like that this was kind of puzzling towards scientists and how they could dive and withstand these different pressures. And they did mention they do have right collapsible rib cages and lungs, and so that kind of helps to squash the uh, alveoli right in the lungs that allow for oxygen exchange, so that might help them withstand that. But it's still really fascinating that they seem pretty insensitive to both the buildup of carbon dioxide, but also they're not susceptible to the nitrogen narcosis like people are. And so this happens when, again, people dive too deep, and I assume this is if you're just uh, I'm not entirely sure when you would get into this because I assume you dive 
uh, swim with oxygen anyway, so you're just getting like an oxygen rich environment. But maybe if you're like trying to hold your breath, or are, again, I'm not quite sure when you would get this, but if you have too much nitrogen, you're not getting enough oxygen, right, to replace that, and it's just right nitrogen versus oxygen in your blood, you're gonna have more nitrogen dissolved, which would give you kind of this drunkenness. And so you, Oh. Uh, okay, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so that explains the danger. Yeah, so that's why you wouldn't want to dive too deep, because you're going to pass out. But for some reason, these creatures, the, all the dolphins, the whales, are much better at withstanding that. And so they even determined, so this was kind of fascinating because they were trying to determine, well, maybe they have some sort of adaptation where they don't get sick from the nitrogen. But they've studied the bones over time and looked at especially like older specimens and found, you know, bone damage. And so maybe over time, you know, they do suffer something physiologically, so some sort of damage from all that nitrogen. So kind of interesting. You know, still not 100% sure how all this works for the dolphins and the whales, but it is really fascinating. And so then we can divide it into tooth and knot. So then if we're looking at our tooth, so our dontoceti, we have dolphins, porpoises, killer whale, and sperm whale. So all these are more hunters too. And a lot of these also use echolocation to try to find objects. So a lot of these animals, right, they can see, they have good eyesight, right, but you can only see so far in the ocean. So it's just hard to, hard to distinguish. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just that the cloudiness of the water is what limits, right, how far they can see. So you, you just can't see that far in water. It doesn't transmit light like, you know, the air. So that's why they have the echolocation to help. And then so looking at dolphins versus porpoises. So porpoises are smaller and have a stout body shape. And then they have a smaller dorsal fin and blunt or flat teeth. And then versus dolphins, so they tend to have a larger streamlined shape and a hooked dorsal fin and pointy teeth, so kind of like your killer whales. So highlights so they're blunt now. They should have put a picture of a porpoise. And pull one up as we look through them. And it's like we mentioned, they depend on echolocation. So their good vision is again limited just by the ocean. And so they emit sounds from their blowhole, and then the sound passes through. They have a special melon, which is just an organ on their skull. So let's just a pull up a picture of a porpoise. So you can see right a little bit smaller, kind of blunt nose. Oops, that's funny. We got dolphin the emulator. Versus right dolphin where it has kind of that longer pointier. Some more pictures. So you're getting a lot flatter. back to echolocation. And so, again, they can send their sound through the water and how it reflects back. They can determine information from that. And they also have special inner ear structure that helps them kind of pick up those sounds. So 
difference is showing the different parts and how it makes the sound here. Just forcing through. And then, of course, again, the blowhole and the melon for the dolphin. And so it's reflected and returned. And, of course, right, it can interpret it. And we mentioned, of course, new noise pollution can affect it. So that goes back to the wind turbine issue that we brought up with the whales, which I actually saw, I mean, it seems to be a big issue with, what is it, the North Atlantic whale that's, like, already endangered, and then the wind turbines. So if they're depending on any sort of, you know, echolocation or any senses, right, those wind turbines, if they're as noisy as they're saying, yeah, that could definitely confuse the poor marine animals. So makes a lot of sense. And so, of course, people prescribe a lot of intelligence to these whales. So we kind of mentioned this as well, that, you know, dolphins maybe kind of like kids and uh, even stories of, like, dolphins saving people. Or I think, right, there's been other stories of, like, dolphins saving someone's, like, cell phone or something crazy mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. But so we, you know, we think they're intelligent. Obviously, right, we can't really measure an animal's intelligence that well, and we could go on to IQ tests and whether they're really a measure of intelligence or what is intelligence, but we assume they are somewhat intelligent since they have a large brain relative to their body size, and then they tend to communicate with each other, so we've noticed that, right, they have all these clicks do in language, and so their brain structure is also, appears complex, and of course they're also trainable, but again, who knows, right? People always get excited, and we want to uh, anthropomorphize, like, animals especially. Like, that might have been an issue with the, who was it, Coco the gorilla? Like, people were saying, like, he was really talking, but then some people later say, like, he just was doing stuff and, like, not really, like, there's no meaning behind it. So who, who knows, right? They can't take an IQ test for us, so... And let's see, different whales. So then we have baleen whales. And this is going to be our blue whale, finback whale, humpback whale, gray whale. So all the whales. And so now that you have a different tooth structure. And so they have, instead of teeth, they have these baleen plates. And let's first look at the picture of the plate, All right? So this is an example of the baleen and what it looks like. All right here's just like one individual slat. So these things are huge, right? And and it is. There are, there's some. Well, it's more of the, the keratin structure, so like your nails and hair. So yeah, very much similar. And so. It needs to be very fibrous because of how it works. If I could scoot over. So, of course, right, the whale opens its large mouth and takes in everything that is in that area. So any fish and organisms, krill, everything, right, goes in there. And then he clenches down. And, of course, all the water rushes out. And all the little fibers that you notice catch all the tiny krill and any other fish that are in there. So yum. So that's how whales, of course, can eat basically ton a ton of water and then be given a nourished by all the krill and other little zooplankton and everything it eats in there and filters out. And so these are just, of course, the different whales. So it mentions that the gray whales have no dorsal fins, so that tends to be more of a bottom feeder. So again, you can tell how the ocean really recycles everything, so everybody has different places where they eat. And then the right whale has, is long, has fine, finer baleen, and these are apparently very endangered, so a lot of these whales are endangered. Of course, they were whaled 
I mean, killed historically. A lot of them have come back, so of course they were hunted for their oil to be used. And then the uh, roar quail whale is kind of, I think it's this guy that's shown in the picture, yeah. And so again, kind of this long, big body is here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's totally about to. He's eating. So. And so again, right, they use their baleen to eat, fill their mouth with water. That's so. <sighs> That's pretty crazy. I mean, that'd be. <sighs> that'd be awesome to like see in real life. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty awesome how they do that. And oh, they're also famous for their migration. So they go from the coast. Uh, the Arctic coast up here, downtown to Baja, Mexico, except it mentioned there's a specific coast group that tends to hang around here during the summer instead of going up. So I'm not entirely sure why. And then so if y'all have gone on cruises or something, then, you know, this is why you would hope to see some whales going along this sort of migrational pattern. I still don't ever see Oh man, that's a you gotta, you gotta take us all with you. <laughs> all right, so new field trip. We're all gonna crash your boat. Oops. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's cool. Actually doing pretty good on time, shockingly. So now that leads us to chapter 15. So now switching over to the benthic environment, so kind of more the coast or right off of the coast. And so this means right benthic communities are going to be more variable than, than the pelagic we were just talking about. So we we're just talking about right the ocean mainly. And so this includes a wide variety of habitats. And so we'll also talk about corals in there and of course hydrothermal vents. So all these are a wide variety of communities. And so 90% of the quarter of a million known marine species live in or near the ocean floor. And so these vent Thick organisms, of course, need to live on the continental shelves, so usually not too deep, but we'll talk about that, right, because deep in the ocean, they have to be supported by something, usually a hydrothermal vent. And then the distribution of the organisms is also affected by surface ocean currents, which is also interesting, trying to track those different distributions. So, of course, scientists are trying to figure out where they have similar organisms and how Currents and other migrational patterns may have caused that or what led to that. And so again, this is kind of a big picture idea that keeps cropping up over and over again of where the life is. And so the life needs to be where there's a lot of primary producers as well. And so we have areas of uh, high biomass, and so looking right at our purple region, so this is kind of extremely high, and 
right? We're expecting it to be near the coast, so that has to have some sort of land mass. It can't be too deep, right? It has to be shallow enough to get some light. And we mentioned, right, the, the plankton, the chlorophyll distribution and also the phytoplankton, so they have to have nutrients. So we mentioned the equator was actually less nutrient dense than we might imagine. And we can, we can draw this, right? So our phytoplankton, limited by nutrients, right? So we mentioned, and this is kind of last chapter ideas, so we mentioned this middle area. We don't have a lot of upwelling because we have that permanent thermocline there. And so actually it was not as productive as we might have thought for all the sunlight that it gets. So again, just lacking nutrients, not lacking sunlight. And so a lot of these middle latitudes were more productive. And so we can really see that, you know, especially up around here where we have these purple regions and a lot of this, of course, following our currents as well. So again, we can see where our biomass is and see how it extends out and is the least right in the center. So we mentioned that as you get into the deep, deep ocean, there's not a lot out there unless, right, there's like a random pocket or something, a hydrothermal vent or some sort of of tectonic activity that's opening up something where you can have life. So that's why it's so sparse. So our big picture idea. And so now looking at our rocky shore then, we can have epifauna. And this just means that they are attached so they're attached to something on there. So this could be right, algae attached to some rocks or crabs or other snails that are just more attached. And so we have our diversity of species. So our tropical latitudes have a lot of diversity and a lot of algae diversity at our middle latitudes. And I imagine this would also have to deal with the light since, again, the tropics, you're going to always have kind of that steady, what do you call it, steady, like, energy of light, so the same proportion of light throughout the year, versus as your mid-latitudes, you have different changing of light, and so different wavelengths, so that's why you would probably have different algae that are better at absorbing different wavelengths of light, so that makes sense there. And so then we're looking at our different intertidal zones. And so they're just characterized by how wet or dry they are. And of course, the animals, the, where they live, and kind of their characteristics depends on all these little mini zones that we'll kind of look at in some more detail. And so looking at our spray zone, so this is our super tidal zones. So our organisms have to avoid drying out. So a lot of them have shells, and so we have periwinkle snails, this little rock louse, and this barnacle. What are the what, sorry? Limpids. Limpids, where are they? So here's the limpet. Oh, it makes sense that they look like a little snail. But. Yep. 
Do they taste like mussels or? Kind of. Kind of. Salty mussels. <laughs> and so, of course, right, the super tidal zone. So this is above all the tides, right? So we should probably have added that. So above high tide. So again, that's why they have to avoid drying out, so they're not getting a lot of water. And so looking at the high tide zone, which is next, so it's still kind of dry here, obviously. So they, right, if it's a high tide, that's only when the tide is the highest. So otherwise, they have to have some sort of adaptation. A lot of marine algae is found in this area. And other rock weeds, so barnacles, mussels. Oh, there were the limpets you were asking about. And then so moving down, we can go back to the other picture. So now right, we're kind of moving down. So we started up at the spray zone and then moving down. So high tide zone, right, middle tide zone. And so middle tide, more mussels, sea lettuce. There's our limpets, so crabs. And then low tide zone, right, we have more algae, some sea stars, sea cucumbers, sea anemones. And so, right, they would be kind of at the, attached to the bottom here. Let's go back. So again, middle tide zone, we mentioned the barnacles, the mussels, and then those sea anemones. This is kind of cool. So here's a sea star, so eating a mussel. So it's prying it apart. That's kind of cool. And if we had gone to the coast, we probably would have seen some mussel bed. Oh, uh, what? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like I said, we bought some hermit crabs because the uh, stock room was overexcited, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have some hermit, cab, hermit crab friends to check out. So they have, have their little claws, of course, when you play with them, if you want to play with them, you know, what? They, yeah, they, they, the hermit, they, they were excited. They're little pets, yeah. So if you if you want to play with them, they, yeah, they'll pinch, but they, I mean, I've never been pinched. I'm, like, honestly a little scared of them. <laughs> but, yeah, it, I guess it's just, like, a little pinch, so it'll, like, hurt, but it shouldn't be, like, that Bad. Like not like, like you've seen those crabs like grab onto people like they're yeah. they're kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Yeah, we're gonna have to buy our hermit crabs some like shells to grow into. So. I, my understanding is like they have to get a new shell every so often because they're growing. Yeah. And then I'm not really sure like what their size limit is or if they like keep growing forever. I don't know enough about them. And so there's a little wild hermit crab that's found this shell. And so then we have sea urchins. And so they have these little tooth mouths and hard spherical shells and some spines. So you probably have seen them before. Pretty tasty for sushi. And then our low tide zone. 
So again, this is going to be abundant with algae. We mentioned the surf grass previously. And of course, how many animals hide in the seaweed and the seagrass. And so here's some crabs. So of course, crabs have an important role in that they're scavengers. So that also helps, again, keep everything clean. And so they hide in the rock cracks during the day. And then they feed on algae at night. And of course, they have this hard exoskeleton. And so you can, again, probably see them running across the beach. And so let's see what we're looking at. So sediment size, of course, we've mentioned this before. It's related to wave and current strength. So again, just how much energy those waves have to deposit. And so that gives the beach different features. So again, looking at our different intertidal zones. So high tide, middle tide, low tide, and then below the tide and all these different organisms. And so looking at these, so in fauna then just refers to burrowing, so in, right? So going like into the sand. And so that helps provide a stable environment. So for example, like the bivalve mollusk, and of course bivalve, so they have two shells and soft body inside. And so showing how right the mollusk can burrow down with its little foot. So it has right, a special foot and that helps it bury down. And of course it can feed. And then it has a little siphon. So I can answer your question. I saw like all of these like mounds, like uh, blue I, they should probably be alive, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. As long as, I mean, because they're, they're just washing up, they're just attached to something. So. Unless, you know, something else had happened to them, but I don't see why they shouldn't have survived potentially. And then, so then you have the worms. I think we mentioned the worm in a previous chapter, but it burrows through, and then sand can pass through, kind of like, you know, your regular earthworm, how it handles dirt, so same thing. So it can obviously extract, right, nutrients through that. And then we have our crustaceans, so segmented body, hard exoskeleton. And so, again, crabs are in there. Yeah, poor crabs. Oh, which one? Yeah, for the the spider crab question, because it mentions that they sh at least uh, said they share some sort of like common sea ancestor. Yeah, but that's just uh, right. That's more of the name. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, but just to clarify, right, so this would be, so according to Google, this is like their common ancestor of spider and crabs that would have been like an ancient sea creature, they say. So that's where they say, I guess, the split happened, or that was the common ancestor, and then they split off from there. So, yeah, they're like distantly related. <laughs> but yeah, excellent. And then we have these echinoderms, and so these are just little creatures that kind of bury in here, so like your urchins or starfish. So echinoderms are also include your starfish. And so again, they usually have something to the surface so they can exchange nutrients or water and get out excrement or whatever. And then these neofauna, these are small. So they're small marine organisms. So these are only about two millimeters or so. So looking at these little pictures, right, they're all really small. So here's one on, on about the two millimeter scale. So it's a crustacean, so related to shrimp and krill, but just a lot smaller. Then they also have nematodes in here. So this would be more of a worm. And so again, they can be found in the sediment and all the way up to potentially right, some deep ocean trenches. So this all again depends on what nutrients are available. Uh, I would ask Google just to be sure. I don't, I feel like a water bear would fall under there. And then, so let's see. So I'm looking at our mud flats. So again, we can have eel grasses common, some bivalves, other crabs. And then, so looking at the subtitle zone, and uh, this was at least one cam that the Monterey Bay had really nice, was like the kelp forest cam. And so, right, this is just under the tidal zone. So it's always gonna be underwater. And then of course, right, this kelp is attached and then it has these little pneumocysts, which I'm sure you've seen, right? That's why it looks, has those weird balls uh, when you see it later. But that's filled with gas to try to help it float so of course it's going up and trying to get like the bull yeah exactly yeah so the bull kelp was a big example that your book lists of course how large it gets and so and you got to see that uh, And here's more, I think that's more bull kelp pictures. And so this kelp, right, a lot of them is fast growing too, like two meters a day. And of course, right, this provides a lot of uh, shelter for organisms. And so this is just showing a map of the kelp distribution. And so, right, showing the kelp with air bladders, again, like the bull kelp. So that's all, of course, dominant on our west coast that we see, and really in a lot of places of South America, tip of Africa. And then shrub kelp. So a little smaller species, so that's tends to be in these more northern latitudes. And 
And so then looking at our rocky bottom, so this is right shallow offshore, so we're not deep out in the middle of the water, just right off the coast. So you're going to have lobsters. And so they live in kind of relatively deep water, so 65 feet, so that's kind of cool. And they're going to be scavengers, so going along the bottom. And they can also, of course, eat some live animals. And this makes me kind of hungry here. Look at this big main lobster. And of course, huge claws for self-defense. No, we didn't talk about that, but if you want to... They don't, like, their, their shells don't break down by age or something like that. So it depends on the really long time. They don't die of old age. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the telomeres. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to look up lobster, like why they why they can't do that. Oh, well, maybe I'll have to look into it later. And then, so then we have oysters. Some, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Depending how you feel, you know, yuck or yum here, but. And so oysters, they have a thick shell. So if you remember, right, they tend to have this thick shell to try to protect them. Since, look at the next line. So they're food for basically everybody else. So the sea stars, fish, and crabs, and these snails. And so here's a snail, and this is pretty cool. And so it has some sort of acid that can then right, bore through the shell. So right, the shell is going to be basically calcium carbonate. So kind of how you did in lab, right? You dissolve your shell. So the snail is doing the same thing, boring a little hole. So then it can start releasing some digestive juices in there and eating that oyster. And so again, another concept that we keep talking about is these coral reefs. And again, we mentioned that these are shallow water communities, generally in the tropics. So they generally flourish in the warmer waters. And of course, they're very diverse. And so they start off as these little polyps, which are just small little organisms. And then they start building up in these communities and making coral. And that's uh, it's questionable so there's a lot of okay. I mentioned it here so let's skip down but I, I wanted to look into that more but I think there's also a lot of questions still on what causes the coral bleaching and like how bad is the bleaching because I think initially we thought it was super like devastating if the coral was bleached, but I think it can kind of regenerate. But this is all is a lot of research still, and so a lot of it could be right. It's just whatever stressors lead to the bleaching. So it's a very symbiotic re relationship, right? You have the coral, you have these other zooplankton organisms that are there, and so if right, these symbiotic organism, if something happens to them, again, right, not sure what conditions, because right now we're just talking kind of vague, so that could lead to bleaching. Yeah, and there's, there's questions about that, too, again, with the temperature sensitivity, and I didn't want to go into it, because there's also, like, Right, like there was panic, oh, like the coral reefs are dying, but they could also be like growing in other areas too. So it's, 
Yeah, so like there's a lot of panic right now with the climate change, but you know, if if the warm if the earth warms too in like different areas, like the reef could grow in different areas. So there's a lot of uncertainty of like, are the oceans warming significantly? You know, what's really causing these bleaches? Maybe they go through some sort of cycle. So that's still still a lot of research because again, these are really complex systems, so it's hard to know exactly you know, what upsets them, because it could be like pollution to other external environmental factors. Uh, even, I don't know if y'all have gone swimming recently. Gosh, where was it? Where they were like banning, banning the oxybenzene uh, sunscreen. You guys know what I'm talk talking about? So sunscreen could... Yeah, exactly. So that could be another issue, right? You have so many tourists coming in with the sunblock, and you know, a lot of those organic-based sunblocks probably aren't good. And uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if the titanium dioxide ones, their effect on coral reefs are considered safe. So it's only the organic ones that are banned. But you know, again, who knows? New research coming out all the time. All right, so back, back up to here with our coral reefs. So we mentioned that they're pretty temperature specific, so they kind of exist in this middle zone here, as we might expect. And so red shading indicates high coral diversity. And again, good areas of research to just continue watching and seeing what is actually going on with these ecosystems. And so we mentioned, right, we need some warm water, need some sunlight, so we have some photosynthetic uh, phytoplankton and then also some zooplankton so that can also come in and establish. And then you want some sort of currents to bring in some nutrients, but then we also mentioned, right, usually they take place and kind of a little sheltered barrier area, so kind of protecting the coral. And then, of course, right, normal ocean salinity is good, so obviously not where you have some sort of brackish water, fresh water coming out. And then, so the coral reefs are also contain algae and mollusk and other, the foraminifers as well. So we mentioned those little creatures. And so they have all this, the uh, mutualistic relationship with the algae. So the algae provide food, of course, and then the coral have nutrients. So very symbiotic relationship. And so it shows the little algae capturing the plankton, and so bringing the food. And so again, a lot of symbiotic relationships in the reef, and these mixotrophs get their nutrient from the algae, so again, these are the coral, the foraminifers, fungus, and mollusk, so all of that depend on the algae. And so again, looking at our light, so our light, of course, influences where the coral reef can be. And so looking at, right, this reef flat, about 60% of the surface light remains. And then going down, right, at already 50 meters, you only have around 20%. And of course, down below, right, 4%. And so you really don't have a lot of light there, and then of course down below, right, insufficient light for coral. And so down here, after the coral dies off and breaks off, then you might have some coral rubble and a sinking over there. And so, right, you could even have coral buildup, so some calcium carbonate. And of course, right, there's going to be many fish taking advantage of the reefs. So obviously, that creates nice habitats and a safe 
area. They can blend in. We kind of mentioned, right, their crazy colors before to help them kind of blend in with the corals, so all of that. And so here's a little different coral. So this coral, this is a unique type. So most of them, again, we mentioned they have a calcium carbonate structure, but this soft coral does not. So that's kind of cute. And those, you can see the polyps on the coral really nicely. And so it mentions, of course, the Great Barrier Reef, and it has a large diversity of species, and obviously is a tourist attraction. And so it goes back to sunscreen. And so again, why do corals get bleached? So obviously, right, this could all be a potential factor. This is where, don't know, have to study the exact spot specifically. So, of course, fishing, tourists just messing, poking with the corals. Because don't they say, like, you're not supposed to touch them? Because I, I think it used to be, like, people would go and, like, grab the coral to take home. So, of course, that wasn't helping. Yeah, I mean, that makes, you don't want to crush everything. Exactly. So relatively delicate with, you know, tours tramping about. So obviously don't want to do that. Try not to disturb it. Corn, they used to have a big barrier reef around the bottom. It went all the way out down by the Keys. So they purposely pulled those in. That's uh, a lot of Miami and everything because it's a really low level and sort of sea level in the swamp. Like you can still find a lot of the old um, little houses you go or they So much for that. And built on top of crushed coral. I've and never heard of that before. <laughs> they, they stripped the, the reef and uh, you know, they what? tore it to the, at the, the lead break with little waves and tore it to bait it. So they flattened it out and spread the sand into a nice larger, flatter bank so you didn't have as many waves of that reef. So Miami is still that as well. Well, that's uh, both fascinating and depressing. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and so. I think this is another theme that's come up, but of course, right, what happens with all the runoff is it contains sewage. So obviously, right, that starts in the rivers, but then that river, as it dumps out into the ocean, if it were to somehow dump into a place where there's coral reefs, obviously we mentioned, right, they're probably not going to be the ne near the mouth of the river where you have the mixing, but again, wherever you can get sewage discharge and runoff into the ocean, and again, there's agriculture fertilizers, so that could, of course, all influence and hurt the coral. Well, it's one of those, like, back to the algal blooms, right? So we have, if you have high nutrient levels, you know, it all depends what happens. So it's just like taking things out of their balance. So anytime right, you have a system in equilibrium, basically, even if it seems good dumping nutrients, if you have a lot of you know, organisms thrive at once and then maybe the predators can't handle it all or whatever, right? that could all obviously mess up the ecosystem. So it's, it's all just a balance. And so this is pretty cool. And so we have this uh, sea star that eats the coral polyps. And then it will start growing these little polyps. And so we mentioned the coral bleaching, you know, and so it mentions other potential causes. So again, surface water temperature fluctuations. Not sure about this UV level thing, but you know, again, good areas to research. I'm not sure what they even mean by this one. And, 
of course, pollution, salinity changes, and disease could also strike. And so just other diseases, so it mentions, right, these different diseases. So some of what you want to study is, like, how do those originate? How do they, you know, spread? So all that's a factor. All right, switching to the deep floor. So we mentioned that the deep floor, a lot less is known. And so, of course, the problem is if we're not really sure where these communities are, right, it's hard to explore. So that's obviously a limiting factor. And we can use, of course, our robotic technology to help explore. So it mentions, I think, Alvin helped explore. And a lot of light, of course, is absent. So mentioned that. Pretty cold temperatures, so look at that. That's kind of fascinating. So right at the range of the waters, we mentioned the overall ocean water temperature only ranges from, I think, like, to 30 or 35. So it's right there at that limit. So pretty extreme temperatures, pretty cold. And at the bottom, so as we have lower pressures, or as we go, sorry, lower depth, higher pressure, that means there's more oxygen just because it's more soluble at greater pressures. So that pressure keeps the oxygen in there. So that could be advantageous. And so we can also have, right, these abyssal storms, which can affect currents, and can all of that can, of course, change different patterns and how nutrients are transported. And so, of course, the issue is, well, there's not a lot of primary productivity, right? We don't have... There's no photosynthesis down there. And so there's, of course, a lot of adaptations for finding food or synthesizing food. So we mentioned we also have those uh, chemosynthesis for our organisms. And so this is, again, why it's also difficult to study because you're not sure where there could be a food supply, so we mentioned if a whale sinks, right, then we can have a little, a bunch of organisms would probably be there. Or same thing with the hydrothermal vents. We don't know where they all are. We're trying to find them. I thought whales would be like a They don't all, no, I think they usually sink. Yeah, I mean, it, it can happen where they, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, my understanding is it's pretty rare for a whale to wash up. Uh, Nicole was in the soccer room was actually telling me a story like a couple of years ago. There was like a whale that washed up in Oregon. and Yeah, she mentioned that too. Where they, they uh, so I don't know if you want to tell the story since you know the story. but if, <laughs> A whale washed up. Yeah. <laughs> 
my news article. You should have heard. It's all mine. I think there's even video. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, they usually just try to get them back in the service, but that way when the high tide comes in, everyone can pick it back up afterwards. Yeah. It, it, it depends on the area, but usually they just try to get the surf and pick it back up. Yeah. Depending on where it's at. So that's ideally what you want, but yeah, that was a, it was a great story. <laughs> Of whale chunks. It ticks off a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't imagine the smelly aftermath or like what that. I mean, the show was a blast. <laughs> yeah. According to Nicole, it was like stingy, like super, super smelly. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's video on YouTube of a lot of stories on it. They even celebrate it, like I think they sell t and stuff in the town. Yeah. They do. They talk about it like every year when it comes up. Oh, man. Or maybe that's like the right level of excitement, right? Where the biggest thing is like, we have to blow up that whale. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. And so back to our deep sea hydrothermal communities. And so again, very extreme conditions. So relatively cold waters or moderate. And so again, chimney vents. And so the other issue with these conditions is they are acidic so a lot of these thermal vents and so it also mentions so they have different chemical composition but they tend to have the black smokers with sulfides so we mentioned that and so again it mentions that these are pretty diverse and that's pretty cool but again they're going to be centered around the smoker so that makes, obviously, discovery difficult. So Mike's not here today to argue that, yes, maybe we can find millions of more new species down in the ocean, and then we'd have more species in the ocean than on land. And so it even mentioned in your book, right, that they were discovering lots of organisms all the time when they were down there. So it was like all new species. And so, again, since we haven't mapped out the seafloor, we don't know what other organisms we might find. And so here are some hydrothermal vents. So like we might expect, they're going to fall on right fault lines. So we mentioned our divergent mid-Atlantic fault line. And of course, right, the ring of fire here. So we have some more deep sea vents. But they surmise that there are probably more that we have yet to discover, of course. So we'll see how that continues. And so lots of weird life forms, so different tube worms and giant clams, and you can still have crabs down here. And so again, the chemosynthesis, so we mentioned this before. Just remember this is from the archaea, so the archaea bacteria, so the very simple life form. So we mentioned that distinction in the domains And this is at least somewhat important. So um, I, I probably won't ask you like the exact formula, but you want to at least kind of note the similarities and differences. So you look at this chemosynthesis, and so it takes hydrogen sulfide, water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen, and it makes sugar for itself that way, and sulfuric acid. So it's good to know that it at least requires hydrogen sulfide. And note that it requires oxygen. So that's kind of important because, again, there's a lot of oxygen at those depths. And right, they're not synthesizing oxygen. So that's different from our photosynthesis. So we probably want to make that distinction at least. 
where the chemosynthesis requires oxygen, but photosynthesis, right, creates it. So, and again, they're both produced sugar, though. Just the chemo one has the sulfuric acid. So again, the extreme environments. And so these vents could be active for years or decades, so that probably also depends on right, the, the tectonic plate activity, what's going on, and how hot that hot spot is, and if that's an active hot spot. And so they mentioned these animal species can be similar at widely separated vents, so they propose that the larvae might drift, and maybe even right, these dead whales could you help spread. So there's lots of theories. Again, not quite sure, so probably a good area of research. How do these communities all kind of relate? How are they similar? What are they, how are they different? And so again, these vents are all different in their chemical and geological characteristics, so they can have different diversity. And what is the uh, Just that the whale, right? So if your whale dies randomly, that could be a landing point for those little polyps to like hang out or the larvae and then continue on to another deep sea vent. So we're not quite sure, right, how they exist, how they migrate, but they can migrate at least far distances seemingly, but we're not sure how. And so again, lifespan, it's volcanic. So of course, volcanoes are sporadic. And they can both die when the vent is inactive, or maybe, you know, lava spews out and kills everything. Oops. And, you know, if you want to play the origin of life game, maybe it could have originated at these hydrothermal vents. Sorry, trying to finish since we're over out of time. And again, note archaeobacteria. This has come up a lot, so might be an exam question. And so let's see. This last little bit is these different saline environments and different, like there's Florida escarpment. And so, right, different seeps can also provide different communities, so if you have like hydrocarbon seeps from oil, that can be like methane or hydrogen sulfide again seeping out, so you could have different tube worms or again the chemosynthetic muscles and tube worms. Again, we'd expect that at our plates, so anywhere our plates meet, so it looks like there's a methane zone there, so these giant white clams that can process that sulfide. And yep, so that concludes it. So again, we still have our new frontier of the deep ocean, and who knows, right? So they just make a claim there, but who really knows how much biomass is down on the deep floor to be determined. All right, we are over out of time. So we'll take our 10 minute break and Transition over to lab. I think I forgot to print out your lab. Sure, so the blow up will happen in 1970 near Florence. Okay. So the reason why it's on a lot of people's minds, they just celebrated the 50th year anniversary. Uh, <laughs> there is some original video from this. Oh my God. <laughs> They were worried that people were going to try to climb on the dead whale and it might fall in. Really? That was their main reason for blowing it up. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs>